is, first of all, I'm not just going to talk about marketing. I think one of the issues that we have in our industry right now is that the things that we can influence are bigger than our industry. So when I talk about marketing, um, uh, there's lots of things that, that we do as a company, and I'm sure you've seen examples of by other uh, presenters today, that actually isn't marketing. It's a product or a service, or it's some sort of, uh, it's a piece of consulting, or it's, uh, you know, it's, it's far more than that. So, so uh, marketing is, uh, in this sort of connected world, a pretty sort of narrow way to look at things. The other, the other thing I want to uh, make a caveat about is, is, you know, if what we do as an industry is that we sort of mediate this relationship between companies and, and, and their audience, uh, then, you've, then we need to think about media as something larger than what we've been thinking about 50 years. And, uh, and so I would, I would suggest that software is media, right? So all the things that uh, I can do on this bloody little thing here, you know, uh, is media. And, and so, it, you know, it, it spreads, again, not just into communications, but into sort of enabling technologies. And you can change a business with software, as we're, as we're well aware. So I'm going to talk about, uh, about uh, the sort of periphery uh, and the sort of width of, of all of this. And, uh, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with uh, a, something that I figured out about a decade ago at RGA. I've been at RGA for 13 years. And, uh, and when I started, it was a, it was a digital boutique. Um, prior to that, it, you know, it was a production company that did some sort of amazing feature films and stuff. But when I, was, when I started there, it was a digital uh, boutique. Um, and, uh, and I noticed that as we sort of started to expand our our sensibility, our creative sensibilities, I noticed that, um, that I've got different sorts of this in the room, right? Now, obviously, this is all that you guys buy, right? We, 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 we pay rent and you guys buy the brains in, our, in, in, uh, in agencies. And, uh, and so it's sort of, it's important that we understand how people think creatively. Uh, because what, what I've recognized pretty early on was that there, if you were to be brutal about how to classify creative thinking and cleave it in two, like the hemispheres of a brain, then you'd say that there's two sorts of creative uh, thinking. There's the storytelling and there's systematic design. Right? Now, we started in this world, and, and, and we started to hire people in that world. And, uh, and the reason I, uh, I became intrigued about this, these two ways of thinking is that uh, creative people have this sort of hubris a similar hubris to, uh, uh, to Michael Jordan deciding that since he was the best basketballer in the world, he could be the best baseballer in the world. And we saw where that went. It's about to happen to J Jared Hine. But there is this, uh, <laughs> there's this idea that creative people, once they're creative, that they can do anything. I'm going to go and design some fucking furniture. I'm going to, you know. And the truth is we've become good at something because we've done it for fucking 10 years. And we've got paths in our brain that have made us very good at something. And, uh, and so what I noticed was that a lot of the really good systematic designers at RGA that were good at designing interfaces and digital experiences, as soon as we started to expand into more narrative work, wanted to just go and do it. They, they assumed that because they had the title of an ECD that they could walk over to our content studio and, and sit behind an editor and, and cut a video. And, the, and, the, and, you know, and mo mostly the, they weren't very good at it. And, and the same, I think, is true opposite. Right? If someone has spent uh, you know, 20 years writing TV scripts, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to compete with Silicon Valley when it comes to coming up with ideas uh, for applications and, and enabling technologies. Um, so so, so I, the reason uh, I came up with this sort of, uh, this, this organizing principle for creativity is to make sure that people knew what they were good at and then worked with people that thought differently, right? So having realized this with, with people, I actually, uh, uh, did a little bit of reading about the brain, which is why I've sort of displayed it like this. And it's true uh, that the, that the left-hand hemisphere of the brain pro processes things one at a time, right? It's a temporal processing unit. Uh, the right-hand side of the brain processes things all at once. So it's more architectural and spatial. It sees a relationship of things all at once. And this was essentially the difference between some of our really good XD designers and, and creatives and really good writers. That's it. That's a difference. One is no, understands the world as a, as a series of revealed moments, and the other person understands the world and creates things that are connected in space and, and have sort of patterns and systems, right? So I'm going to talk a lot about this story and system, the play between these two things, because I think that you can't work in modern media now and modern software without having systematic designers. And obviously, the most time-honored sort of uh, creative skill 
in our industry is storytelling, and that is still true to this day. And how those things work together is, is something that I'm very concerned about. Right? So at the top of every one of my uh, 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 the, the, um, offices we have around the world, the, we always have a storytelling lead and a systematic design lead. They're both creatives, they're both leaders, and the way they work together is more important than how they work apart. Right, so what I'm trying to get to is that you need a lateralized brain in your organization. And, and if either one of these things predominate, then, then there's a sort of imbalance. So the tension between these two things is a tension between these, right? Good narrative thinkers are very good at subtractive thinking, right? Because they're about the revealed moment and they're very concerned about simplicity. And that's why great narrative thinkers are good at coming up with essential brand truths that resonate and that we understand because they take all of this stuff and they turn it into something simple that we understand. Good systematic thinkers, and this is true of uh, you know, the sort of digital part of our industry, are good at possibilities because they understand this sort of recombining of nodes because they see things connected all the time, what Jeff was talking about, bringing two different ways of th thinking together to create something else. That's basically what software is now. It's, you know, that's what innovation is. If you look at the the Nobel uh, Science Prize winners for the last decade, it's always teams. It used to be like one heroic scientist, right? And now it's like these really unusual teams, a biologist and a physicist, and it's because that's how you innovate now. We're connected to all the information in the world, and so, hey, innovators, you, you can recombine it in a different way. So now I'm going to talk about how you bring those two worlds together, because clearly they're two different cultures, they're two different skill sets, but the, but the challenge that a lot of you guys have is that, okay, I've got to, you know, I, I, I want to do all of this stuff. How does it synthesize? What does it mean? So we've come up with this sort of framework. I'm going to show you a lot of fucking frameworks, by the way. But all these frameworks come out of practice. None of these are theoretical. They all come out of a, a, a looking back at work that succeed and say, oh, fuck, how do we do that? And then trying to explain it to ourselves. So, and then it helps, us, it helps guide us. So, so we've got the, these two worlds, uh, and, and the other thing I'm going to talk about is the journey from thinking to making, right? So we've got process here, and we've got sort of sensibility there. Within this sort of framework is everything, everything else I'm going to talk about in this presentation, right? Now, for 50 years in our industry, uh, this, was, this was how we marketed, because that's what the media that we had at our disposal could do, right? It was top-down. You as a company wanted to say something about you or a service or a product, and you would tell the world, right? And you would hope that somehow you intercepted them. That was how it worked. So there's this other world that's emerged in the last 10 years that Hosey was talking about elegantly uh, from Vice, right? Which is, which is this bottom-up world, which is, which is basically media systems that we all interact with, right? Anything with the interface in front of it, which is most screen-based media now, is a system. Anything that, that I have agency over, because it has interface, I can, I can I can connect with other people and with companies and I, have, and I can get stuff done on this media, is a system, right? But it's bottom up, right? You don't really have a lot of uh, uh, control over how people are going to use that. You're just creating a, a framework within which they can behave, right? Um, and, and right now, uh, we sort of think of this world from an agency point of view as producing digital tactics, right? Lots of little things that, that sort of help and enable uh, and have, have utility, right? Now, the problem is, if you look at this, that most of you probably have an agency that to the, to the top thing, an above-the-line agency, right? And, and, and a few scrappy little digital agencies that do the, the bottom-up stuff, right? Uh, and in the middle, there's this sort of gap between what you're saying and what you're doing in media, right? Uh, or, or software, right? Or service. Uh, and, that, and, that, and that gap, right, is in the middle here, is really hard to forge because you go to your traditional agency and they say, you know what, once we figure out the big idea, Right? Then, then you can go and push it down into the digital agencies and, and figure out how it lives in pixels. Uh, and then, and then these, these punks at the bottom are saying, oh, fuck those guys up there. We're going to make useful things for you. Don't worry about them. They've been treating us like snotty kids for too long. Right? And you're caught in the middle saying, hang on a second, I'm trying to create a coherent brand here, and these things are fighting against each other. So what I'm suggesting is that let's use a different language here, and let's try to get what we call a whole idea. And the definition of a whole idea is that is it's, it's, it's got to be an idea that uh, is both a message and a behavior. Now, the interesting thing about that is that you can always create a message around a behavior, but you can't always create a behavior around a message. So that, in some, that would suggest that you need to invert the model. Figure out the system first or the behavior before you figure out 
the, uh, the story, right? So here we have it. The whole idea is this sort of this overlap between stories and systems. Um, and the relationship between these, these two things I'm going to look at very quickly, right? Because this, the, 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 I, I want to get into uh, some specifics because these frameworks are all very well, but they've got to be tools that we can, we can actually use. And this is one that I call the media moments sort of framework, where we look at the continuum of media moments between stories and systems. Uh, because you've got all of these options, right? There's so many contexts of media right now out there that you've, you know, you've got to curate them, which ones are going to use in what order. So this is a sort of a, a quick way to look at how media moments work. Not formats or channels or anything like that. None of that stuff matters. From a consumer's point of view, I have media moments. I'm not like, I'm now going to view a video. It's like, no, that's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I want to look at something that's going to be interesting, or uh, I'm now going to use an enabling technology is, is, uh, is not what I'm thinking, or I'm going to use an app. I'm trying to get something done. So, so you know, as I was saying before, that you know, for, since Burnback, we've been very concerned with, uh, with creating sort of entertaining stories that get people engaged in brands. Um, and this was, again, like the, what media could do for, for most of our, uh, our industry's uh, life. Um, but the, the issue with, with, with that is that we used a language that was... Uh, that was good for entertainment, but not, not very good uh, uh, for much else. So the, the sort of language of advertising has become, or, or has been, the language of metaphors, because metaphor can make you feel something. It's like a proxy for something. Uh, and we're still infatuated with this idea uh, of, of advertising as, as entertainment, which is why the last night of Cannes is so uh, looked forward to, where you all sit in this darkened auditorium and watch TV spots from Argentina. It's fantastic. Um, but, you know, obviously we do. We do stuff like this. We think it's important, but this is not the only media moment, and it may not even be the most important one, right? And with the advent of the internet, a very important media moment is information, right? So, the, you know, often when you fire up your browser or pick up, pick up your phone, the first thing you do is go to a, su a Google search field, and you're looking for something. You're looking for information, right? So we have access to all the information ever made all over the world instantly. It's a really important media moment, and importantly, this idea that, you know, that, that, uh, that stories are about emotions and systems are about some sort of rational decision, that's also bullshit, because you know you've had a great search result. It can be very emotional. If you're, looking, if you're trying to find some information about a drug that's going to help a, a, a relative that has an illness, that's a pretty good media moment when I get that information, right? So, you know, so it's not the, there's emotional sort of uh, currency in all of these media moments. Now, the problem is that we're working in this really sort of complicated environment where going from left to right can take months and thousands of PowerPoint presentations and, and, and silos of organizations. And so the chances are when you get to the end, it's not going to be interesting, right? Because you've just been killed by consensus. So one of the sort of process things that's really important in this complex environment is the ability to skip forward. And we can learn this from Silicon Valley. You know, make it before you even think about it, right? Get it out there, right? So, so you've always got to start from true. Right, so the context, you know, whether it's research or what, what you what you already know, but then be prepared to take an intuitive leap. Right, you're going to get m a much better result if you don't if you just jump forward and start making. Go somewhere interesting. Good creatives and strategists, and you know, and uh, they have an internal data set of things that they've done right and wrong over over the years of their career. When they make this intuitive leap, that's what's informing it. Let them do it. Don't crush them. Right. And you can always go back with your, you know, with your planner or your experienced strategist and make sure that it's relevant. Oh, that's right. Oh, we just made something that's great. Isn't that fantastic? Or oh, maybe we need to change that a little bit. You know, it's sort of working, but we need to do this. And then, and then obviously, just make it understandable. So this is a, this is a sort of a, a, a simple way of saying um, bring decisions forward, right? The worst thing that we find uh, dealing with, with big, complex organizations is when the decision maker is at the end, right? And the people in between, you and the decision maker, are trying to second guess that decision maker, and they're always wrong. Always, right? So you want to shortcut the decision by getting to making quickly and then, you know, and then sort of steering it properly after that. And that, I believe, is it. Thank you. <laughs>